Well, welcome and good morning. Welcome as we gather here, and of course, welcome those people that are joining us on YouTube and Facebook. We are brought together by the love of Jesus Christ to this place to speak our faith and to live our faith. Now, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Uh, we are con con going to continue our revival study. So those on Wednesday nights at 6 o'clock, it's not too late. We've had one study, but you can still jump on and be a part of that. If you can't make it to that, on Thursdays at 1 o'clock, we're doing a Zoom version of the study. And if you still can't make that, I know people are busy, we're going to be posting those conversations on our Facebook page later. So you'll be able to watch and kind of hear about the conversation we have. But I would really encourage you to grab the book, even if you're not going to be a part of the study, read it. Um, it's really a good way to kind of start looking into who Methodists are and where the beginnings were and who John Wesley is and what did he believe. And that's kind of what we'll be talking about for the next couple of weeks through the study and then also through these sermon series is looking back at the faith of the early Methodist church and John Wesley and how he eventually brought around a revival of faith in his time. So that's something important to know. Also, in the next, this week I will be having coffee on Tuesday, but then there's going to be two Tuesdays where I'm going to be gone. We're going to have a family reunion, a couple other things. So I will be gone. I'll be here there this Tuesday, but then the following two Tuesdays I will be gone. So just kind of keep that in mind if you'd like to come see me. But I would like to invite you, if you haven't come before, Tuesdays, except for those two, that I will be at the Bean to have coffee. Just come on down, sit and talk to me. Uh, we'll have a conversation about life, about faith, about whatever you'd like to talk about. But that's not the only time you can come talk to me. I'm always there in my office. If you'd like to come, you can make an appointment. I would love to sit and hear about your life, about what's going on with you. There's so many of you, and I care a lot about what's going on in your life, but sometimes I feel like I don't get to talk to you that much. So please come, sit and have a cup of coffee, make an appointment if you'd like to, or just come in when I'm in my office, and we'll sit and have a cup of coffee. I'll drop with what I'm doing, and we'll talk about life. Because part of faith is sharing that faith together, and we're going to hear a little bit about that today in the sermon. But we also have a special thing we'd like to have, so I'm going to ask Jaden to come forward to tell you a little bit about her faith and a little bit about her time at the um, Prairie River Camp. So welcome you up. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Jaden Gosson, for those of you who do not know me or have seen me around. And I'll be talking about Prairie River Camp. Um, Prairie River Camp is a Christian camp right outside of Bryceland um, that welcomes all ages to just spread the Lord and spread God's love. And I first found out of, um, I first found about Prayer River Camp from Sandy. Um, she brought my youth group in fifth and sixth grade to Prayer River Camp, and we would stay there and just help out um, with anything that the people needed in wells, and we would like serve others and just spread Jesus' love. And it was just really fun, and I like love to help people because it just makes me so happy. And Sandy's just such a good person. She, <laughs> you are. You are. <laughs> she brought us to Pearl River Camp, and we would um, stay there for probably about three or four nights, and we would go into wells, and we would pull weeds or clean windows. Um, I just recently went to a summer camp, high school camp, at Pearl River Camp, and I just love the people and the experience every time I go to Prairie River Camp. It's like the place itself just has so much of the Holy Spirit. Like the second you like go onto the property, it's just like Holy Spirit, boom, there. Um, uh, what I've done in PRC, I have, well, I went to winter camp um, in January this year. Um, I went to summer camp, and they have like rock wall and slip and slide and other stuff. They have worship morning and night. And I just like encourage some of you to, um, if you have like grandkids or kids or something at home, to like take them um, to the camp. Or you guys can just like rent out like a cabin or something and just stay there like as a family and just do stuff and rent out the camp. Um, it's really fun, actually. Um, there's usually a speaker. Usually, if you go to camp, they'll usually have a speaker talk to you at night. And I just really hope that some people take this camp as an opportunity to spread God's love. So, thank you. Thank you, Jaden, for telling us a little bit about Prayer River Camp. As we, that was one of our missions a month, but also about what it means to be faith in action. So thank you very much, Jaden. And now let's turn to our opening songs and call to worship. Good morning. 
It is good to be together again on this Sunday to praise and worship our God. Please stand as we begin. Children of the living God. God loves us with the love of a parent. Children of the living God. Despite our failings, God continues to save us. Children of the living God. We are here to worship the God of love, justice, and grace. Amen. Amen. from Psalm 85, verses 8 to 13. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand. For those who fear him, that is his glory, may dwell in our land. love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and will make a path for his steps. Let us pray. God of salvation, we are grateful for the gifts of your love, a love that has no bounds, a love that keeps reaching out to us, calling to us. We are more than your people. We are your beloved children. Forgive us when we forget how much you love us. Forgive us for times we are unfaithful to you, times we fail to do as you called. Thank you for loving us. You are God, and we trust that you journey with us in all things. 
Amen. You may be seated. Now we like to each week highlight a way in which you can serve or get involved. And for our mission this next month, we're going to be talking about giving uh, school supplies. And so we have a little screen for that. So donating school supplies that we collect every time this time of year. And I know it seems a little bit early. I know school isn't until September, but it'll come quick. And I remember as a kid, I always was kind of sad to see the school supplies start showing up at, at uh, um, at the local stores when it was getting too close. But what we're thinking about is collecting school supplies, which we're going to give to the school for people who need it. So, you know, every year kids go to school and they need extra this, they need extra that. And sometimes there's kids that don't have enough. And so we collect these school supplies every year and we give it to the school. So we have a bucket which will be out on out in the front here and I believe one on the side here. And you can just buy some extra school supplies. Maybe you're going to take your kid in and buy something or maybe you're just at the store and you see those gigantic displays of back to school things and grab some extra stuff. If you want a list of what we kind of what they kind of need or what they'd ask for, you can ask the office and we can kind of give you an idea of what you might want to pick up. But each year we do this, and it really is a good way to show our love to the community, show for those people that maybe won't know it came from us, but education is very important. And so when they sit down to do schoolwork and they have those things that we need, they need pencils and pens and all these kind of things, they'll know that somebody cared about them enough to get a little bit extra for them so they too can learn and grow and have a future. So that's something we're going to do right now. We're going to be talking about throughout this month, rest of this month and then also next month about giving these school supplies. So I want that in the back of your head as faith is something that isn't just we, we have, it's a faith that we live as well. And this is part of living our faith. Now, as we are the body of Christ gathered together, we're going to pray together. And as always, there's going to be a little bit of quiet music towards the end of the prayer. That's your chance to say something out that's on your heart or keep it in your heart because God will hear. So let us pray. O oh Lord, Father God, Almighty One, you've called us to this place. You've called us into a true and authentic faith, a faith that we live, a faith that is in our hearts and in our heads, a faith that others can see and others can know the goodness, the goodness that you would have in each and every one of our lives the goodness that brings around the fruits, the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits of living a true life with you, O Lord. May your love be shed abroad in our hearts. May we seek that out, O Lord, and help to guide each one of our steps as we step closer to you, O Lord, as we seek what it means to be holy and live holy lives in our lives, as we seek you in holiness, you in holiness, in the way we live, and you in the way we care about the people around us. Lord, help us to strive to see your face and to know you better and for you to live in our hearts. But Lord, as we live in this life, as we seek this holiness, there are also difficult things in our lives, difficult things in our lives and the lives of the people around us, lives in the people we care about, and even in lives of the people we don't know, those people that you called and said, those are our neighbors. Lord, as there are difficult things in our lives and those people that are our neighbors, which is the whole world, things of illness and surgeries and fear and worry and care, worries of violence in our, in our world, in our country, worries of war and so many other different things, Lord. Help us to have calm hearts. 
Know that you are indeed Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, that you hold all things in your hand. But Lord, even as we come here with those difficult things in our hearts, we also come here with so much joy, so much joy of faith and life, so much joy of summertime, so much joy of children being with us and their voices being a part of our, our congregation. Lord, you fill our cup up to overflowing. Even as our cup continues to need to be overflowed, you continue to pour more and more so that we know the goodness and the fruits of life. So, Lord, as we come to this place this morning, we bring all that we are and place it before your feet, all that is rising us up and all that is weighing us down, we give to you, O Lord, this morning. Almighty God, we as the sheep of your flock, we pray to you, and so in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Now please join me in praying the way that Jesus Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now is the time for our scripture reading. Today's reading comes from Peter 1, 13 through 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, for it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy.
And now our gospel reading comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, 43 through 48. You have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, and he makes his son rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. So today, as we continue as week two of our revival sermon series and study, I want us to kind of remember what revival means. We talked about this last week, but revival is reinvigoration, to be renewed, to come back from a time of illness to a time of health, to come back to life after a time of sort of downness, to be reawoken. That's what revival is all about. And brothers and sisters, I definitely need it this morning. I don't know, but I'm a little extra tired this morning. If you know, my wife had surgery on Friday, so there was a time of stress and difficulty. And it was really kind of in my mind as I was at the hospital and watching the little board that told when my wife went into surgery, and then at the end it says, waking back up. And I thought of that, revival, being brought back. How revival means to be sort of asleep or tired and then being brought back to life. And in a way, my wife was revived at one point. Revived back to life and back to me and back to my arms, which was a wonderful thing. But after a time of stress and tiredness, one needs revival, doesn't they? Don't we? You know, I think our world has gone through a long time of stress recently. As we had the pandemic, as we've had things going on in our lives, things in our world, there's been war, there's all these things. And it seems like it's stress on top of stress on top of stress. And you know one thing I notice, I see coming out of the pandemic, coming out of this difficult time of our country, is I see less and less people here. I see less and less be, uh, people being a part of Christian faith, authentic Christian faith, and I think, boy, we really need that revival. We really need that thing that brings us back to Jesus, back to God in our lives, back to following him, the one that can bring us to live into the fruits of life. Remember, hope, peace, love, joy self-control, generosity, all these things that I think the world needs more now than ever. Well, that's the reason why we're talking about revival. That's the reason why we're going through this study is, once again, I think our world needs revival. We've been kind of looking at different places. Last week, we talked about what revival looked like maybe in the time of Revelations. We talked about what revival looks like in the time of John Wesley. And if you don't remember John Wesley, John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist movement. Because remember, it was a movement before it became a church. It was a revival movement. And so we're turning to that today, and we're turning to John Wesley and his experiences, and how he eventually started that wonderful revival that he was a part of. Now, John Wesley, as I said last week, was a professor at Oxford. So John Wesley was a very intellectual person. And he got together with a group. He was his younger brother who started a club. They called it the Holy Club. And it was all about this. It was about living holy lives. You see, they saw something in their life that they were missing. They had lived faith, but they really didn't completely live a full faith, an authentic faith. John Wesley would say it this way, that he felt half a Christian, that he knew all the things, that he had sort of begun to take that step in the faith. He was actually an ordained at that point, but he still felt half a Christian. And so they asked John Wesley to come in as part of this holy club and to really shape what they were going to do with their daily lives. Because that was really what they were asking themselves. How can they know that the, as they said, love of God is shed abroad in their hearts and they give themselves wholly over to God in all things? Now that's a big and difficult question, but they sought to get to this by what does it mean to live a holy life? And so John Wesley, as I said, being an intellectual, his first thing to do was to sit down and begin to read the Bible. You know, that's kind of what I was thinking about when we did the story for the second time is to learn who we are, to learn what it really means to live a godly life, and that means to seek out to be closer to the image of Jesus. 
Because that's what they really wanted to do, was be an image of the risen Lord, to be as much like him as they could possibly be. Now, of course, we can never truly be like Jesus. Jesus was perfect. But to live our lives even closer as images of the risen Lord is a pretty amazing thing to seek out. And to do that, they first learned as they grew. And so like I said, John Wesley was an intelligent guy. He was someone who was very structured. And so they got together every single day and they read the Bible together. In fact, that's where these terms that I had talked about before, that which were in their day not considered good terms, enthusiasts, Bible moths, and eventually Methodists came from, was this holy club that would get together to take very seriously their faith in a time in which people really didn't take faith seriously. And that's why they were mocked at Oxford for taking their faith seriously, for living their life and trying to be, as John Wesley said, holy Christian. And from that, they started to do a couple things, but there was three different or three basic rules that John Wesley came up with that would guide his life from then and on, which was do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. These were the three basic guiding lights that they had as they continued on in life. And John Wesley would eventually start that Methodist movement. And the small groups that he would create had that same basic ethos. So do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. Three simple rules. In fact, there's been a couple books written called Three Simple Rules, which was based on John Wesley's three simple rules for his Wesley movements and his societies as they would get together to do those things and to try to truly live holy lives. Now, at the beginning, John Wesley would get the head part before the heart part. We're going to talk about the heart part a little bit later in another time. But the head part was learning about it and then going out and putting that into action. And I don't know if you know this, but the early Methodists later on would be the first people to start hospitals. They would start education. They would care about education. They would start a lot of universities. In fact, if you want to look it up, you can find a huge list of universities in America that the Methodists began. Of course, later, many of them have turned away from that and become secular, and I don't think for the better, but they have changed. But it's an amazing legacy of the Methodist church and the Methodist movement. They started hospitals. They started orphanages, all these things, because John Wesley really had a heart for those people that he thought of as the least, the last, and the lost the people that truly needed to hear the love of God. I still think one of the most amazing stories of John Wesley was he, felt a, he had a heart for the people who were the miners as they would go into the mine during the, night, during the day and they'd go into darkness and they would come out of the mine when it was dark outside. So they would spend their lives in darkness and they would have short lives because they would live in these mines. Even children were sent in the mines in those days. And John Wesley would be out there as they went in and out as they went back and told them that God loved them. And what an amazing thing for people who thought God did not love them, in fact, thought maybe nobody loved them, to hear that there was somebody who cared. And there was a God that cared about them and was with them through all the things of their lives. That was part of what was the amazing part of this early Methodist church was that John Wesley had a faith that he didn't just talk about, he had a faith that he lived. It was a faith of the head and the heart. And like I said, John Wesley was seeking something in his life. And I don't know, maybe you're seeking something too. Maybe you're sitting in the pews today thinking, there must be more. That I need my faith to be more in my life. Maybe you too have thought that same question that John Wesley thought. What does it mean to be holy Christian? What does it mean to have the love of God shed abroad in your heart and to give your whole life to God? Because that's the question that John Wesley and this holy club were really asking. They saw a world in which people may have professed faith but didn't live it. They saw people who had said that they were Christian but never showed the fruits of what it meant to be Christian. Their lives were not changed by the Christian faith. And for that, of course, they got scorn and things like that, but they were so much, there was so much a part of who they were that they just couldn't help but go out and love the people around them. They visited prisons. They did all these wonderful things. In fact, John Wesley, in his day, they said he would have been a multimillionaire except he gave every single cent he had away because he believed that you could give all you could possibly give to help those around you. So what does that mean? What would that look like in our lives? Because that's part of this beginning parts of this revival movement was them taking their faith seriously and living that faith, and other people saw that and wanted to be a part of it. It's very similar to the early part of Acts when they were living lives that showed love of people around them and love of God, and people wanted to be a part of that. 
When they lived authentically, it says in Acts, that God added to their numbers daily. And it was the same way with the early Methodist church. As they lived authentic faith, God added to their numbers daily. You know, I always think it's an interesting thought experiment of what the world would look like if people took their faith seriously. What would it look like for hundreds of people from each church to go out in the world and live that faith seriously? To truly be Christians 24-7 every day of their lives, try to give their lives wholly to God. What would that look like? Because, you know, when I look in the world, I don't see generosity. I don't see faith, hope, and love. I don't see these fruits of the Spirit. I see so many other things. I see division and anger. I see people turning against each other. But what would it look like for a world where Christians went out in the world and became that salt and light for the world, as we talked about last week? They became that thing that was the leaven in the bread that made the whole better. That salt that made the food, the life, even better. That light that light the way for people around us. What would that look like? You know, the Methodist Church is... Uh, um, well, what the Methodist Church seeks to do is make disciples for the transformation of the world. Make disciples to transform the world a little closer to what God wants it to be. But first, we must be transformed in our own lives. First, we must seek God in the holiness of our lives. How can we seek to live a life in which we live like those early Methodists, where they tried to do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God? I want us to think about that throughout this week. Maybe there'll be little chances, little times in which you can do that. And I know we all live busy lives. I live a busy life, and too often it's easy to kind of have the things that we should be doing pushed away for other things that we, that we think we have to do. But what would it mean to take a little bit of extra time to read the Bible, to hear what God is saying in your life, to seek those chances to be holy, to live a life that reflects the love of God? to live a life that reflects the risen Lord to all that is around you. So, like I said, maybe you're sitting here today and you're like those early Methodists saying, we want something more. We want to be holy Christian. We want to live a life that is fully devoted to God. How can you do that in your life? How can you start out seeking God in your life? Where can you find God in your life? And I said, maybe it's through reading the Bible. Maybe it's through a group that you can gather together and be a part of. That small groups were very important in the early Methodist church because when we live faith together, we can hold each other up. We can help each other out. It's a wonderful thing of community. Remember, Jesus Christ brought the whole of the world together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So we have a new family. That's the family of Christ to which we're to be a part of. So think about that this week as you walk through life. What would it look like? And how can you live a more holy life, a life that leads to God and a life that leads to your life being changed to have those fruits of the Spirit? So what does that mean to you? I want you to think about that this week and take some time to be holy. Amen.
So for our Giving with Thankful Hearts section today, there is just outside the doors here uh, some pictures and some drawings of what the kitchen's going to look like. So if you haven't been downstairs, I'd encourage you to go down and look at the kitchen. It looks just a little bit different than it did before. In fact, if you go on Facebook, you can see some of the images of the kitchen's demolition as they're taking out all the stuff. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to be putting in a lot of new stuff. It's going to look really great. And so what I want to have in the back of your mind is that this wonderful thing is happening, but we're going to need your help. We're going to need your help to help us be able to fund this kitchen as it's going to be a big project. And so, like I said, just outside the doors, there's a picture of uh, kind of a drawing of what the kitchen will look like, um, uh, laying out the plan of that. There's one of the pieces of the cabinet, what it's going to, the cabinets are going to look like. We'll have more going forward. But that's your chance to kind of see the image, the vision of what it will look like. And we're going to be doing a campaign a little bit later to try to be able to pay for this as it is a really wonderful thing for our church. And so be looking for that. Get excited about the things we can do with the new kitchen, meals and times together, gathering together in the basement. So really be thinking about that. And that's another thing I want you to think about is how can we help to utilize it? Because once we have it, what are some things we can do that we can gather together and be a part of faith together here in this place? And so... Look at that, think a little bit about that, and when the time comes, help us be able to fund this wonderful thing as, you know, we're kind of in a difficult time right now in the uh, economy to do it, but it needs to be done, and it's going to be a really wonderful thing, and so be excited about it. It's something to be excited. It's a new, wonderful thing that our church is doing. It's a long time in coming, and now we're going to have this new kitchen to be able to do the meals and things that we want to do. So have that in your mind as we go forward, and like I said, take a look and see how that's going to look in a couple of months. We're not there yet. In fact, the kitchen right now is just basically empty in demolition, but we're working on that. And I also want to special, say a special thank you to all those people that helped. It was really wonderful to see those people get involved, help do the demolition, help take this stuff out, help clean it up, all those wonderful things. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Yeah, I think I... So thank you so much for making that happen and getting that first step done that's going to lead to a wonderful new kitchen for us all. So now I'm going to be praying for the gifts we received today and throughout this week. So let us pray. Oh Lord, you remind us to be holy. You remind us that in your holiness we find joy, peace, hope, and love, generosity, all these wonderful things, Lord. In you we find thankfulness. Thankful because you have given us this life, this chance to be your children, this chance to love the people around us, this chance to live our faith and to live for you, O Lord. So, Lord, as we live for you, help us to have thankful hearts and indeed help us to give thankfully. So, Lord, may all the hands that give be blessed and may all the hands that receive be blessed and may all the gifts at this mission to you, for it is your mission, O Lord, May they do honor to your Son, Jesus Christ, who came in the world and was our greatest example, and he who we seek in our lives. In his name we pray. Amen. Now go on this day. Go on this day and seek Jesus Christ in your life. Seek out what it means to be holy and to be, as John Wesley said, fully Christian. For as you give your life to Christ, you will find God's love in your heart. You will find peace, hope, love, and joy in a world that so desperately needs those things. Let us be a light for this world. Let us be the people that reflect the risen Lord. So go out and love and serve the Lord. Amen.